Ramadas, I'm a medical scientist, um, part of a NAS Patients Education Committee member. All right, my name is Basil Debo. I'm an orthopedic uh, surgery chief resident uh, from State University of New York in Brooklyn. Uh, Igal Samocha, uh, orthopedic spine surgeon, uh, Westchester, New York, uh, currently employed uh, by the hospital there. I was in private practice in Houston before that. Let me start with you, Igal. Uh, how do you usually evaluate function uh, with your patients? Um, well, typically, just in evaluating my adult degenerative patients, I use kind of two, two broad uh, things to uh, evaluate them. I use static rate of refs, which is pretty standard from uh, <clears throat> most surgeons, and then uh, a lot of times postoperatively especially, but also preoperatively, the uh, uh, PROMs, the patient reported outcome measures. Um, and that's basically what we have to look at. Um, there's, there's the, the functional evaluation is really more you know, sometimes the history gathering a little bit, but really, really looking at more objective data in, in uh, the PROMs and in the uh, radiographs. Uh, obviously, there's limitations in that. Radiographs give you a static image, uh, and there may be some limitations in your radiographic capacity. And then uh, the, the, the tests or the, uh, the outcome measures are also limited by recall bias and by, uh, you know, sometimes the patients aren't even filling them out themselves or, you know, the staff might not get it in properly. So there's, there's certainly limitations. Yeah. Uh, what, are, what about you, Basil? How do you traditionally evaluate uh, deformity patients? Uh, yeah, Ram, I think it's a great question. Uh, I agree with Dr. Tsamoka that uh, so far we have two options uh, based on the literature. The first one is the radiographic parameters, which has been really established. Uh, we have SRS-12 classifications for deformity patients. Uh, that were proven to correlate with patient reported outcomes. Uh, so we like those. We have uh, a lot of other parameters that are relevant for full body um, x-rays. Uh, on the other hand, the patient reported outcomes we use are also supported with data for about a few decades now, uh, namely ODI, SF36, and more um, disease-specific questionnaires. But again, those, those kind of subjective measures are still lacking the objectivity of functionality. So, so far we, we have kind of, we are in the very initial stages of thinking about function and, and, and assessing motions in our patients. Uh, there are a few batteries, there are a few tests uh, we, we're going to try to address uh, later on in, in our conversation, but uh, so far between radiographs and patient re reported outcomes, those are the most prominent solutions that we have. Uh, let me ask you what, what what are you what do you have to offer to add to that as far as why we're here functional uh, analysis and functional evaluation of our patients yeah so <laughs> the most common and the sophisticated uh, way is to send refer patients to a gate lab now not all of us have access to a gate lab but if usually if you're working in a university setting or a big uh, or a big uh, group of surgeons usually have an access to a gate lab in a gate lab, you usually find uh, the following. You can have uh, one of the following or all of them, a human motion capture system, uh, IMU system, uh, surface uh, EMG, and any type of force plates or, or, or tools that measure forces. The human motion capture system is, is a similar system like they're using in Hollywood to produce a video games and animations. You put a bunch of reflective sensors on your patients, and then you have a bunch of uh, special camera that are recording the motion of your patients. And they record everything, starting from um, uh, how fast are your patients are walking, how, how, how long they're spending on the ground for each step, their step length, right size compared to left size, especially important for deformity patients. We, we're looking about uh, symmetry, uh, range of motion, sway, and many other kinematics uh, things. Uh, new, new tools come along, which is the IMU sensors. They're much smaller, basically. They measure about the same information, like uh, spatial temporals and movement, but you're not strict to measure those in the labs. You can just place them on the sensors. They can be in the clinic, they can be outdoor, anywhere you want, and they measure about the same thing. The same thing. They can tell you how fast the patients are moving, uh, range of motion for the lower extremity, upper extremity, trunk, neck, etc. On top of that, we have a surface EMG sensors. That's like a regular EMG measuring your muscle activity, but the sensors actually stick to you, so you can move with them, and they're not involving any needles. This is a surface EMG. This can tell you any information on neuromuscular activity, starting from the magnitude of, of the muscles, how much they're actually using the muscles with the walking, standing, and sitting, 
um, uh, muscle onset when they fire each muscles, and we really important care about co-contraction between the agonist, the antagonist, the front of the spine to the back of the, of the spine muscles. We're also looking on the timing between uh, the lumbar muscles in relation to the pelvic and hamstring muscles and see how this all fire together. Uh, the last thing that you may have in a gait lamb is uh, force plays, the measuring forces, and tell you, uh, telling you basically uh, ground reaction forces, joint torques, and other calculations that you can basically get out of it. You know, Ram, I, I mean, when I, hear, when, he, when I hear you talk, it's, 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 it's very intelligent that we have all these tools in our, in our deposit, but when I talk to my colleagues um, about function and, and assessing motion, uh, the, there was also this question about how feasible is to get to be to have a gate lab. How feasible is it to send those patients to the gate lab to do like a 45 minutes test? Uh, let alone that the gate lab in itself is first expensive. Second, you need a smart person like you to run it, and 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 we all know that in the field of orthopedics uh, or spine in general, spine care providers don't always have access to those kind of talents. So, what do you think alternative solutions are to to gate lab, and how do we move this science to the clinic? Yes, yeah, Sir Basil, you're absolutely correct. I mean, uh, the majority of us doesn't have an access to a gate lab. If you don't work in a big facility that is affiliated with a university, you probably don't have a, a, a gate lab. Uh, on top of that, you're right. I mean, um, labor is pretty expensive. You have to get a PhD, a couple of masters in engineering, a couple of people running the lab, along with the whole uh, administration behind it. But the future is bright. There's actually many, many companies that are working to try to simplify the gate lab with, if it was a smaller sensors, or well, uh, definitely much cheaper options. The first one I just did I mentioned earlier is the IMU sensor. It's basically a very small sensor that you can place on your patients, and you can walk anywhere, in the clinic, in the waiting room, in the lobby. Then you can measure uh, the movement. You can see how fast they're working, how much they're limping, symmetry between uh, limbs. Another cool technology that is about to come out is a markerless um, system. That there's actually uh, a, a, a several companies developing a uh, unique set of cameras that you don't need a markers to evaluate your patient's functions. And they can record several people within the same area. So think about this scenario. You can basically uh, place several of the sensors in your lobby in the waiting room. And while the patient's checking in, you already got their gait analysis. While they're standing and waiting, you got the balance test. And while they're sitting, you have the sit to stand test at the same time. And they didn't even see you. Or at the same time, so you get algorithm that push all the data to the EMR. By the time they see you, you already get a gait analysis, uh, standing, a Romberg test basically, and sit to stand and, and other stuff that you want to do. Um, more technology coming out which with cell phones apps and our smartwatch wearable devices and we see more and more application apps uh, out there that try to help us to measure sway, measure uh, walking speed, measure range of motion. So the future is, is, is really bright. I mean very soon we're going to have a cheaper and more feasible solution to that. Let me ask you a question. So uh, sure. we saw there's definitely need for objective tools to measure your function. Let's, ass let's assume you have, a, you have access to a gate lab or, or a, gate, uh, a gate lab report. How do you use this information in your clinic when you evaluate patients, diagnosis, and prognosis? Uh, sure, that's a great question. Uh, so at Downstate, we, we are fortunate so to have the gate lab. And at the same time, I'm personally fortunate to have the mentorship of a lot of um, scientists and surgeons that believe in functions like Dr. John Dubusset and Dr. Lafage. Uh, in terms of adult, um, we use Dubusse functional test. We actually just published that about a couple years ago. It's a battery of four tests that technically assess the patient's ability to perform certain tasks, um, including the step test, uh, up and walking test, um, dual tasking test, down and sitting test. Um, of course, the closest to my heart is dual tasking test because um, the problem that we are so subspecialized in, in orthopedics and neurosurgery for that matter where we forget that the patient is a whole. Uh, and sometimes our, our abil the patient's ability to do coordination and dual tasking is intimately related to the outcomes of their surgeries. Um, it's a long topic, but um, we have found out that uh, I actually myself met a lot of patients in the clinics, in different clinics, not spine clinics only, 
with dual tasking problem, with coordination problems, with history of falls, with history of spine disease, without actually coming to the spine clinic. So for us, we use this battery. We use the Dubuse functional test for the, for the adult. And we found great results in terms of um, how reflective that is in terms of uh, describing or uh, indicating whether our patients have uh, certain disability in certain forms uh, that we need to address. And, we need, and this way, we know how to meet their expectations as well. Um, in terms of, uh, of, of uh, pediatrics, we have the gate lab. Um, with Dr. Paulino, Ellen Goodwin, uh, we did a lot of studies looking at our scoli kids uh, outcomes after surgeries. Uh, and since the main objective of this surgery is, in addition to halting the progression of the disease, is to ensure that our kids go back to their function or at least maintain the functionality uh, that they have uh, in terms of, of scoli. Um, so what we did is we, we tried to look at whether uh, our posterior spine fusion surgery have any impact on their functionality and how to tailor the surgery to make sure that we achieve the best outcomes in this regard. Um, so we did a few studies looking at the, the length of fusion and how distally you can go uh, in scoliosis and we found that you know distal, distal you go to L3 and beyond actually has significant impact on the pelvis motion and the hips. Um, and that has probably long-term impact. It's, you know That's why we're advocates right now to save more uh, levels uh, and make sure that the patients uh, have uh, you know, at least three or four uh, lumbar segments. So you can, it is, it is definitely a niche, it's definitely difficult to, to have and difficult to have, difficult to have people run it, uh, but it has significant utility, I think. And it has ability to predict outcomes on a very, very long term. Uh, I just want to highlight there's, there, there were studies, for example, that were presented in you know, NAS or SRS, uh, where we, sh we, we saw that 30, 40 years follow-up for our patients, we have this like degenerative disc disease adjacent to the, to the Scoli curve and, and things like that, that now if you use function and gait analysis, you probably don't need to wait 30, 30 40 years to, to adjust the treatment. Uh, I think we need more imminent indicator for an imminent solution. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think there's a big need for a functional component for our pre-surgical planning, especially for AIS kids, you know, when they're so young and you can make so many changes in this in this kid. So um, kudos for that and keep up the hard work. Now, let me ask you a question, uh, Eagle. So let's say you get this um, uh, access to a gate lab or to a report or, or this information. How do you consider to incorporate when you're actually recommending your patients uh, when to return to work or when to return to physical activity. Exactly. That's, that's where, where this is, you know, going to be more pertinent for uh, adult degenerative rather than deformity. Um, we're not quite as, you know, specific about all that that you just went into very great detail. Um, in my practice, really, functional uh, evaluation is most commonly used for return to work. Um, and right now, uh, a lot of that is just based on uh, pretty outdated literature and, and uh, there's not, not a whole lot of strict guidance. You know, I get patients all the time asking, can you fill out this paperwork and this paperwork for return to work? And it, it's a lot of it is, is, is very, very subjective. Um, you know, in the workers' uh, population, you do have uh, functional capacity evaluation tests you can send someone to, but even that is, is based on a, a therapist's uh, subjective evaluation and, and, and a, few, a few measurements, but no real scientific data behind it. Uh, and I think that if we're able to get real feedback and real numbers, uh, we can certainly tailor a lot more of the return to work and, and when, when a patient can go back to work, how much work they can do, what kind of work they can do, um, not just in work, work comp patients, but in, in all our patients, because really that's, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to restore function. Uh, a lot of time that's measured by return to work. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. You know, all medicines transition to a patient-specific uh, treatment. And I think also return to work should be a patient specific based on functionality level before surgery or what is the goal of the surgery. Right, so uh, I guess what, what can I expect if I send a patient to a functional evaluation or functional <coughs> lab, uh, what, what am I going to get back? Yeah, this is a great question. So um, as soon as you refer your patients to a gate lab, uh, first of all, you need to define what kind of testing they want to do. When we're doing all type of sta testing, starting from a walking test, bound test, all the way to sit to stand, lifting, and even like sport activity, if this is the goal of the surgery. And what we're going to do, depending on the gate lab, we're going to hook up to different sensors to the patients. If it's a human motion uh, marker sensors, if it's an EMG, IMU, uh, and you name it, depending on the lab. Uh, then the patient is going to go uh, under a battery of testing. 
right? I will just basically record them, have them to do, to do a normal walking or normal standing and see how they act. Then we start processing the data and we'll do it in two fashions. One of them will define, first of all, what is the severity level. And the way we're doing it, we're just looking at the way the functions and compare it to an age-gender match healthy control. And basically we're telling you how far your patients are from the controls, or basically how much they have to work until to get to a normal uh, functions. As soon as they come back for a follow-up, if it's like a short-term follow-up or a long-term follow-up or a very, very long-term follow-up for AIS patients and deformity that we, we actually track these patients for uh, a decade, at least a decade, uh, then we start doing comparison of the patients and see where they started before the surgery and how they progress, how the function is progress, how they're getting better. And, and, and we always keep in mind where the healthy control that it is and how much they're getting close to it. At the end of the day, you're basically getting a details report that provides you a final functional score to tell you from 0 to 100 how functional your patients are. Okay. On top of that, you get a details information depending on the testing, and they get a specific score for the walking, specific score for uh, the balance, lifting, sit to stand, and other activities. Uh, we are very efficient to upload everything to the EMR and make it like, user friendly, and we actually publish a paper uh, how a functional report should look like, uh, and we live all the basics information out there. I, that's great. I, I could actually see this as a, a tool to encourage patients to do more as well. If they're, if they're seeing their progress, you know, that, that'll tend to push them to do a little bit more, a little bit more. I can get that score up a little bit higher. I think I can work and also, you know, guide their therapist. So we need to work on, you know, you're, you got the sitting part, you need to work on the standing, you need to work on this. So we definitely see that as a, as a, a tool not only to tell us where we are, but also help the patients get further along in the progress. Yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, you can also take this report to the physical therapy, uh, so the physical therapist, and just show them, okay, this is the, the points that my patients need to work. You can come back uh, three years later, whenever you have a Jason disease or a PJK, and you can see where they were a couple of years ago and see where do you want them to be. Yeah. What do you think, where, where are we going from here? Where, how do we move forward with implementing this into more common practice? Uh, any hurdles you probably you see coming up in, in trying to get this more broadly used? Yeah, so the long-term goal is basically to have um, every surgeon use a functional analysis in some, in some fashion, right? The best way to do it is keep uh, up-to-date on literature. I mean, attend conferences, uh, look what other people are doing, look on our gate lab, look, look on the industry, what a couple of technology they're, they're bringing up. Like I told you, a lot of smartphones and wearable devices and IMI devices are going to be very soon feasible and available for surgeon and patients just to collect functional outcome. So I think staying in this loop between the societies, education, and the industry can all, hold up, uh, all of us to grow and build toward functional outcome measurements. What do you think about uh, that? Uh, I totally agree with you. Um, I, I just came back from, from SRS and we had a great meeting and you can feel the, the transition and you can feel uh, the growing interest, I would say, in, in function and, and assessing uh, which treatment to our patients is actually delivering the best motion, delivering the best function, uh, bringing them back not only to the baseline but perhaps sometimes in adult two or three decades before. Yeah. Uh, so I think, the, as you said, the future is absolutely bright. Uh, I think we're moving toward that direction. The focus on soft tissue, on three-dimensional analysis, on gait, on function, uh, all this making uh, our patient as a whole is our, our, our focus by not only looking at their x-rays and how can we do it better, but also how can we bring them to where they want uh, using all the tools that we have. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's about it. Thank you very much, guys, for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.